Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If you're a regular follower of my Deep Space updates, you might have noticed what seems like a sudden surge, an increase in news of China testing key parts of its human lunar mission. Last year, they unveiled an EVA suit and a rover for that same mission. In uh, June, they performed a pad BART test for their next generation Mengzhou spacecraft. And a couple of weeks ago, they released footage showing the testing of the Lanyue spacecraft suspended from cables so that they could simulate lunar gravity, showing it performing landings and liftoffs. And in the last week, the massive Long March 10 booster core was seen performing test firings. And some of you are now asking whether China might actually stand a chance of beating the US back to the moon, particularly in light of the current administration's um, budget cuts. I don't think we're there just yet, but it's not out of the question that China could get back to the moon before the US. Although, to be fair, the US has already been to the moon, let's not forget that. So China's space program began back in 1970, you know, back when the US was regularly landing on the moon. Uh, the Long March 1 was their first launch vehicle, taking the Dong Fang Hong 1 satellite to orbit, making China the third nation to, to uh, show this capability. Uh, the Long March, by the way, is named after a famous retreat by the Red Army in the 1930s. It's supposed to like evoke, um, you know, striving, like endurance or whatever. So the Long March evolved into the Long March 2, 3 and 4, which have become the sort of backbone of China's launch capability. In 2003, they launched Yang Liwei into space, becoming the third nation with a domestic human launch capability. They've had a fairly a strong lunar program with Chang'e 1 through 6, starting with orbiters going through landers and now sample returns, being the only nation to return samples from the far side of the moon. But China's human spaceflight program is known as Project 921. This isn't some sort of sinister codename like Project 66. This is simply a reflection of the program being approved on September 21st, 1992. Now, with the Tiangong space station completed in 2022, Project 921 has decided that the moon is going to be the next goal. And July 2023 laid out the planned architecture for their lunar missions, setting the stage for lunar landing in 2030. So the core launch vehicle for this program is going to be the Long March 10. And this initially appeared in 2018 at a trade show as the next generation crew launch vehicle. It was an evolution of the Long March 5. And it was sometimes known as the Long March 5G until 2023 when during the 30 years of China main manned spaceflight exhibition, it was given the Long March 10 name and it was tailored to carry Mengzhou and Lanyue, which are going to be the spacecraft which will perform the lunar landing. And you know, it looks to me as if many of the important technologies for this were actually developed in the Long March 5, which is currently China's most powerful operational rocket. The Long March 5 was first launched in 2016, and it would be used for China's largest payload, sections of the Tiangong space station, uh, the Tianwen-1 Mars rover, and the Chang'e 5 and 6 lunar sample return missions. So this is like 57 meters tall and almost 900 tons. It'll take 25 tons into low Earth orbit, uh, and uh, of 14 to geostationary. It's got a core stage which uses four YF-77 liquid hydrogen engines, and then it has four strap-on boosters, each with a two YF-100 kerosene liquid oxygen engines. So Long March 5 has been part of China's sort of transition away from these toxic hypergolic propellants, which are storable, to modern, cleaner cryogenic propellants. But as big as Long March 5 is, they needed to go a lot bigger to shoot for the moon. And our first clue, our first vision of this was actually presentations that proposed missions using a massive rocket which they called the Long March 9. And this would be a 4,000 ton rocket using methalox as a propellant. But it seems that that concept was simply too ambitious right now and they've chosen a smaller evolution, the Long March 10. The Long March 10 inherits the Long March 5's 5 meter diameter core, leveraging existing infrastructure for handling and manufacturing of boosters. Both use the kerosene liquid oxygen for first stages. 
The Long March 10, however, is much, much larger. It's 93 meters tall, 2200 tons at liftoff versus 57 meters and 900 tons. Its first stage has seven YF100K engines, and that is assisted by two strap-on boosters, which are also five meter wide with seven engines. Together, this is like something like 2,700 tons of thrust. The second stage is shorter, and it uses two YF100M engines, which are optimized for lower pressures in the upper atmosphere. Finally, the third stage, like the Long March 5, uses liquid hydrogen and oxygen, with three YF75E engines. The entire stack is optimized to send 27 tons of payload into translunar injection. In par parallel, they're also developing a single-stick version named the 10A, and this eliminates the third stage and it uses only a single engine on the second stage and also eliminates the boosters. But yeah, it should be able to deliver the next generation crew spacecraft to low Earth orbit for space station operations. Now, there's also been a fair amount of discussion on developing booster recovery and reuse for this. And there's some very slick animations and various experiments they've done with recovery stuff. But I think right now this feels very much like a secondary consideration and this won't necessarily hold up launch plans for their lunar program. But don't be surprised if we see tests with uh, boosters descending under grid fins. So anyway, the Long March's first, uh, 10's first flight is currently set for 2027 and I presume it will be carrying a test version of the Mengzhou crew vehicle. So yeah, the next generation human spacecraft. It's named Mengzhou, which means dream vessel. And this succeeds the Soyuz-derived Shen Shenzhou, uh, it's about like 8.8 .8 meters long with a service module, 4.5 meters in diameter, and it's about maybe 22 tons. It should carry six astronauts for low Earth orbit or three with cargo to lunar missions. And it's a reusable crew module, has a detachable heat shields, closed loop life support system for oxygen, waste recycling. It's got all modern avionics, autonomous docking. There's an expendable service module that provides propulsion with four main engines, solar power, thermal control system, all the stuff you need. And they performed a pad abort test for this back in June 2025. So that validates that the escape system worked. So compared to Russian Soyuz, it's much, much larger. Against the Apollo command and service module, Mengzhou is lighter but it has a lot of modern electronics. Uh, Artemis is also heavier than this. It carries more astronauts to lunar orbit, but and it should be better in deep space missions. So, yeah, you know, this thing is larger than Dragon, but smaller than, say, Orion. So now we have the Lanyu lander, and that apparently means embracing the moon. So this is a 26-ton vehicle designed for two astronauts. Uh, it has powered by four YF-36 liquid propellant engines. These are the engines previously used on Chang'e 5 and 6. They generate 7.5 kilonewtons of thrust, which is about you know, 80, 800 kilograms. They can throttle these and control them for a slow descent to the surface. And there's also like 16 reaction control thrusters and everything you need to make a lander, you know, like legs, ladders, hatches, docking stuff. There's advanced avionics that they didn't have in the Apollo era, like LIDAR and uh, hazard detection with cameras. But the whole descent actually uses a separate propulsion stage for entering lunar orbit and then initially beginning descent. As the spacecraft gets down closer to the surface, at some point it's going slow enough that they will ditch this stage and it will fall and crash onto the moon while the spacecraft itself then begins a controlled descent to the surface where it's able to complete the mission. So unlike Apollo, China's lunar landing strategy involves two rockets with a lunar orbit rendezvous as opposed to one large rocket with a lunar orbit rendezvous. So first of all, they will launch a Long March 10, presumably carrying the lander first, that would make most sense, the Lan Yu lander, which will launch into orbit, then it'll perform translunar injection. Once it gets there, it will use its propulsion stage uh, chart, you know, engines to enter into low lunar orbit. Now, at some later point, presumably very soon after, they will launch a Long March 10 carrying the Mengzhou spacecraft with three crew on board. That too will perform translunar injection and then an orbit, and then it'll rendezvous with the Lanyu. The two spacecraft will dock Two of the crew will transfer across and then the spacecraft will separate, leaving presumably one in orbit to mine the spacecraft. 
So the Lanyu lander will then perform its landing procedure, descending slow over the lunar surface. Once it gets to a low enough speed and altitude, it will ditch the propulsion stage and the lander will proceed and complete its landing on the lunar, sur lunar surface. And uh, yeah, then it will be great, you know, China celebration, propaganda, prestige, whatever you want to call it. There will be EVAs, there will be flag planting ceremonies, there will be a rover which they will use to explore the area around the lander. And then after they've spent their time on the moon, the Lanyu lander will once again proceed to orbit. And once in orbit, the Mengzhou spacecraft will rendezvous with it, uh, dock. The two crew will transfer her fur back, presumably with any samples they've acquired from the lunar surface. And then that will be left and separate. Mengzhou will then leave lunar orbit, return to Earth, re-enter and land, and there will no doubt be a great many parades celebrating this achievement. So as I said, a lot of this is currently being built and tested. Back in June 2024, the Long March 10 first stage was tested with three engines. Uh, and now they've had a test with seven engines. These are the YF100K. There's some evolution over the previous versions. You know, they're doing these tests because they want to make sure that they can handle this clustered mode, that they don't overheat. They want to make sure the thermal stresses and the vehicle structures are operating correctly. We've had the test of the Lanyue spacecraft, the validating the descent and guidance and hazard avoidance uh, capabilities in lunar gravity. Uh, we've had the pad abort test, we've had orbital tests of Mengzhou to verify the heat shield. And obviously, these are just big tests of parts of the system. Over time, they're going to build more and more and integrate the whole thing. But I'm thinking that there's going to be three Long March 10 launches prior to the human missions. First of all, they will have a flight to validate the booster. And that will probably carry like a Mengzhou spacecraft. Then we're going to have it sounds like they plan to have a full-up version of the mission where they will launch a Mengzhou and a Lanyu into lunar orbit and have them dock autonomously. They might even have them land on the moon autonomously and return to orbit and dock just to demonstrate that all this is capable, right? Uh, and that would mean then that the, it would be launch five before China actually lands on the moon. So while they're talking about their first launch and maybe being 2027, there's several launches before they actually put humans onto the surface of the moon. Now, the next step, of course, after this, there will probably be multiple other landings, but China has big plans. They, want, they talk about the International Lunar Research Station, which is supposed to be a Chinese-Russia-led project, which is really China with Russia coming along. And there's Pakistan, South Africa that are also interested, and this will be a South Pole station that will look at in-situ resource you know, extraction, water extraction. There's uh, the, the Chang'e, future Chang'e missions will be going here first to verify some of this stuff. But this is like, they have long-term plans and they're not slowing those down. And you're contrasting with your NASA, which right now they've talked about putting a lunar um, a, a nuclear reactor on the surface and not much else. And so many people are coming back to, can China beat NASA's Artemis program to a lunar landing? Well, China's date of 2030 is six years after the initial plan for Artemis 3, which we all knew wouldn't happen, but it's starting to feel like we're moving further and further into the future. I, th I think if everything works out, 2028 is currently possible, but there's lots of headwinds, right? We've had heat shield issues with the Orion spacecraft. Uh, we've had pl issues with the spacesuits working. The, you know, the lunar gateway keeps on coming up. We've got like weird stuff with budget that constantly happens. Facilities on Earth, which uh, are people want to shut down to save money rather than actually using them in this capacity. And then, of course, we have Starship, which is a formidable launch vehicle, no doubt. But it is a vehicle which has really been designed with going to Mars as its primary application. It's somewhat oversized for this. That may ultimately be a good thing. It might help the US actually exploit the moon a lot more than China. But right now, a lot of people are feeling that the fact that they went for such a big lander is really like sandbagging the whole program because they have to have so much more capability. Whereas China, really, they're just wanting to get their foot in the door. They understand that being the second country to land on the moon is a big deal. And they, if they can beat the US back to the moon, 
that will just be the icing on the cake for them. So I can see they, them working a little bit harder while the US sort of keeps on talking about getting more commercial involvement and not actually working with a sort of consistent plan. And, you know, this is really the, the US over the last 20 years has had some sort of back and forth weird inconsistencies. Like, you know, after the shuttle program, uh, after it was clear the shuttle was going to have to be retired, George Bush launched like Constellation, right? And Constellation was underfunded and was going to take too long. And Obama really wanted to switch NASA over to commercial stuff. So he basically cancelled Constellation and you know, gave SpaceX and other people a whole bunch of chances to like really ingratiate themselves into the launch process. Uh, that turned out to be a really good decision, but we also still got SLS, and SLS was also underfunded. And when Trump talked about going back to the moon, uh, the, the politicians who were very much supporting SLS made sure that SLS had to be a part of this, and therefore slowed a lot of things down. I mean, you know, like critics of China love to say, oh, China just loves to steal stuff from other countries and make it their own. Well, you know what? Look at SLS. Literally the engines, the boosters, huge part of that thing were already built. And the US can't even build it on time as it's funneling huge amounts of money to its various partners who are operating with all the swiftness of continental drift. And yes, SpaceX is moving very fast and breaking things. And they are breaking things. I'm sure there's a lot of good data coming out of this. It doesn't look great to everybody. I think every launch is spectacular. I'm sure they're learning a lot from every flight. And I look forward to Starship Super Heavy being a fully reusable launch system that will change the world. But will the Lunar Starship be ready in time to support Artemis 3? Or will it be the long pole in the schedule that perhaps pushes things out? We don't know. There's a lot of unknowns at this point. As I said, I don't think that the situation is that dire. I think that uh, NASA will actually get back to the moon in time. I think Blue Origin's going to get their lander together, maybe in time to you know meet China on the moon. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm pretty sure that Mars sample return, that is a race which may well be lost to China, if you consider that. Uh, China are focusing on a much more simple mission than what the US did, where the US sent up a rover to get all the coolest samples. China are just going to take anything they can get and bring it back, because that plays just as well with the common person in terms of propaganda slash prestige, depending upon which side you're on. Uh, the US, whenever it finally gets its Mars samples back, that will no doubt be a massive bounty of, uh, you know, scientific knowledge that they'll gain, but it might not play as well on the international stage. So anyway, look, this is a sort of, uh, this was intended to be an outline of the Long March 10, Lanyue and Mengzhou. There's a lot to go here. There's another five years before these are expected to be landing on the moon. There's a lot of potential bumps along the way on the road to international prestige. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.